Music has existed throughout all of history in various different forms. This is clearly obvious. The wealth of musical genres that have been defined since the very dawn of music itself is an indicator as to how diverse it can possibly be. Within pre-contemporary history, the styles have been attributed mostly to geographical locations and cultural heritage. The music was created to define environments, religions, and to individualize them as their own unique identity relative to the region they originated from. There was no need to evolve them past their original source because, before the recording industry, those styles of music were the only thing other local musicians could draw from. At this time, people were generally united with a specific sonic aesthetic as a means to connect with not only each other, but generally to some kind of higher power. In cases of individuality, which pertains throughout all of history, a person would evolve the style they learned in a natural course. However, things have changed since then. In fact, the very structure as to how people even consume music in the first place has become so disjointed and dogmatized that the initial purpose of what music is meant to accomplish continues to get battered down into tropes and stylistic conventions. The destruction of musical culture has been so powerful that people think the way in which genre cycles occur in the spotlight is a completely normal and natural phenomenon. However, this way of genre exposition is merely a phenomenon that has existed for only 100 or so years. Before, genres existed mainly as a cultural exposé, something that exists eternally free from the concept of new or old. In the contemporary era, there is the notion of needing to generate a new sound every few years in order to fulfill the desires of the increasingly impatient world. Now the genre, which may have had some significant meaning to some, is now treated as an old music trope with its individuality and spirit faded away into academic dogma. Now the typical critic might sit around and blame the damn millennials, or the dirty hippies, or those evil imperialist capitalists who exploited music for profit, or the Jews! It doesn't really matter. Everyone in this scenario is to blame when we exist in a free society where we are given the choice to listen to whatever kind of music we want to, and generally, this commodification of genre in the first place might not even be that bad of a thing. Let me take a step back and proceed with a different view of to the history as to how music has evolved in the first place. For looking merely at how genre evolution is purely a negative impact on culture is a very cynical way to look at the situation. It is safe to say that this commodification has in turn helped push artists to create literally thousands of different styles, genres, subgenres, microgenres, etc. In fact, the very industry was dominated by the individuality of certain artists choosing to create new styles, and the sound flowed smoothly throughout the decades, evolving, changing into bigger and better things. This was largely part to how music was even listened to by people. Technology was a major factor in terms of helping to evolve the sounds. Not to mention, the names for these new styles were ill-defined in terms of what they meant conventionally that musicians had prolific ease in terms of evolving them and changing them into newer, individualistic creations. Something that had plagued musicians since the 18th century, since conforming to the standards of a certain way of composing music meant your entire livelihood. But in the 20th century, music rebelled against this notion. These were not simply music styles, these were attitudes, ways of life, and most importantly, a culture. Jazz in many senses was a united rebellion against strict musical rules and conventions to a specific synthesizing of cultures. Rock, on the other hand, was the reimagining of the industry sound, once more a synthesis of two polarizing cultures. It is in fact the only genre currently that specifically requires an electric guitar sound in order for it to be qualified as rock and roll music. Then there's hip hop which was a reimagining of the recontextualization of music itself, to where we know we are drawing from previous inspirations constantly, and is showed quite literally through the innovative use of sampling in drum machines. Although hip-hop was not the only genre at that time to delve into the terms of recontextualization, as well as turning strict conventional ways of songwriting into a more freeform and repetitive rhythm, it was the only genre at that time that had a strong cultural following and aesthetic which in turn was made it so marketable in the first place. 
but let's go back again and begin talking about what this wave music sets out to accomplish in the first place. First off, wave music is not necessarily a specific genre, excluding the SoundCloud phenomenon of wave as it is essentially trap music with reverb. It is not a sonic aesthetic, it isn't even a culture of any kind. It is merely a music industry phenomenon, and was something that at first had no real influence in the world, but mostly arrived from a large network of musicians, radio hosts, and label heads who simply just wanted to put out the best music, and the most relevant music, to which younger audiences would gravitate towards. There were no Spotify playlists, there were no curated genre charts, it was only the music and what was new. While there were plenty of cases in which seediness and corruption occurred, the market for what people listened to was dominated merely by whatever people listened to. The journalists who denounced the new sounds were ignored, as they were defined as old or not with it in terms of understanding the new music coming out. This new music I am speaking of at the time of creation of any form of wave music is of course jazz. It was a new rebellious style that came from the underground of New Orleans, a genre that was unified by all walks of life, literally created primarily by what was called at the time Creoles, an ethnic group of people who were both a mixture of white and black people. Some key figures in its creation were Scott Joplin, who coined and created the genre of ragtime. as well as Jelly Roll Morton and Sidney Bechet, who were known to have popularized the new sound into the mainstream. Jazz was freedom at its core, where before music had been confirmed only to be a certain way, jazz broke convention so brutally that even now studying jazz theory is about as complex and intricate as any classical composition class. But before jazz, the genre that began it all was in fact the blues. And since its creation, Blues has been categorized, commodified, genrefied to the point where it is no longer what it represented in its creation, and that was in the simplest terms, was music that healed the soul. But saying this to a music professional, I guess you would call, would result in a backlash of genre tropes and definitions as to the so-called blues scale, or the 12 bar song formation, or whatever arbitrary style that an academic might use to define something as intricate and personal as something like blues. The concept of even using a title for this kind of music is purely accidental. Mozart didn't change. Bach didn't change. Some people call it progressive, Louis. Well, what is progressive? You tell me, because all we play is good music. We never did worry about styles. Ain't no such thing as styles in music. Ain't but two kinds, good or bad. That's all. Now that progressive and all that jujitsu music and all that, you can have it. I'm not interested, because I get my applause for playing good. In any language, a note's a note. Do you think, then, that some of these um, people that play today uh, spend too much time in worrying about fantastic pieces to play and forget the simplicity? I'm not interested. If I buy a record, it suits my taste, got the beat and the tone and what I like, that's all. I ain't worried about the fellas they ain't, what they ain't doing. That ain't my position. Uh, I got a lot of my personal worries. So I go by my ear, what I hear. It is important to note that the music and soul came first, not the name. It was a reimagining to the classification as to what classical music genres did in terms of categorizing the broad scopes of styles within music of the time. But none of these styles were ever in the quote-unquote mainstream during their heyday. They were merely there so as people could understand broadly what to expect in whatever performance they went to whether it was a waltz, a sonata, an opera, etc. But then, everything had changed. By the late 1920s, jazz had evolved greatly out of its roots, and was at that point the most popular music to listen to. It carried itself in various styles, forms, and even breached into classical compositions, such as George Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue. It was equally dance music as it was listening music. It was gospel music, it was religious music, it was sinful music, it was gangster music. It was, in many cases, everything about what America was during the turn of the 20th century. And we both felt that maybe once a year, even in the hallowed halls of the symphony, maybe jazz could come in and play a rather important jazz work. As I said before, I'm pretty mouthy, and I talked about this for a couple of years and didn't give the concert. And George and I talked about it many times. And had decided on the uh, title, which would be the Rhapsody in Blue, because 
uh, I felt uh, that, uh, and George agreed with me, that it would be silly to write a symphony which demands certain form. Architecturally, it's pretty complicated, and it doesn't allow too much free movement. And a rhapsody, of course, means that you can rhapsodize, you can uh, wander all around. And... At this time, famed trumpeteer and jazz innovator Louis Armstrong broke the rules of jazz once more with his development of swing, a style that was aimed at pushing out of the restrictions of rhythm. By playing against the notes themselves and being off time, it somehow magically worked, and to this day still continues to baffle music scholars as to necessarily why it works. While this merely should have been a new stylistic development to carry out if a musician chose to do so, it was immediately swept out and pushed out as the new frontier for the development of music, in this case, a new wave. Swing should merely have been kept as a stylistic choice in terms of being off time to create a swinging feeling, but it eventually became a strictly conventional dance genre for younger adolescents and college students. It is no surprise that this came to fruition during the Great Depression, a time in which people were desperate for any attempt to make cash and to escape their harsh and cruel lives. To commodify specific stylistic convention was a huge marketing tactic that had never really been done before. While jazz music was still evolving and doing innovative work, swing music took the mainstream with big bands and massive dance halls from the likes of Benny Goodman, Count Basie, Artie Shaw, and Duke Ellington. It became so central, and as artists were struggling to make a living, many of them conformed to the style and left behind their own unique way of writing music in order to be a part of the new music industry standard. These artists who attempted to perform different styles of jazz would often be ignored during this time, much like how Ellington constantly put forward his own compositions that more often than not strayed away from swing. Ellington continued his own unique style of jazz throughout the 30s, despite being financially depraved. He described swing and jazz in these terms. Jazz is music, swing is business. We can pinpoint now the creation of pop music, and that creation was synonymous with the development of swing. During the 1930s and during World War II, pop music took its first form by taking the big band format of swing and would feature singers from the likes of Cab Calloway, Ella Fitzgerald, Frank Sinatra, Not King Cole, Bing Crosby, Dean Martin, Billie Holiday, and several others. The wave of swing by 1947 had ended, and music itself seemed to have no direction in terms of having that same marketability. Charlie Parker developed at this time bebop, which became the new sound for jazz, and it was extremely unconventional for casual listeners, drawing on fast rhythms and incredibly complex scales. It was once more another attempt to deconstruct the already commodified jazz sound. You know, and uh, re-emphasize his blues, and then you get people like Charlie Parker and Dylan this month. You know, Dizzy Gillespie. You know, um, the people that say made the kind of uh, uh, revolution before it's the bebop revolution. It was to, to, to revitalize the music by, um, you know, taking it away from commercial swing. This was a style listened to mostly by college students and intellectuals of the sort which gave birth to the beat generation and inspired writers like Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg. Because I don't, I don't remember anyone naming it that. No. I remember them saying we were playing bebop. The meat, it was just jazz music, that's all. Uh, I know I didn't. But after they, after they had become popular and say, Dizzy Gillespie came your bebop, and I said, well, okay. I had a little thing, a little hat, bebop hat, bebop glasses, you know. And, uh, by the time we got around to the Apollo, when I can 45 with my band, it was about ready for it. Then. But the real style of music that stayed true to its origins throughout all this time was, in fact, the blues a genre that continued to stay in its roots and never breached the scope of mainstream success. But a new sonic aesthetic during the 1940s and early 50s started to take off in the underground. While the mainstream focused on big band crooner music, a new style which harnessed the use of the newly crafted electric guitar started to take center stage. The sound at the time, often called rhythm and blues or delta blues, evolved with the likes of Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf, taking the innovation of adding this instrument to create the new sound. Be 
The sound carried itself around the south and the underground clubs and certain radios who would play it. But soon, big disc jockey personas started playing these records into the mainstream. A lot of people wonder, what is the blues? I hear a lot of people saying the blues, the blues. But I'm going to tell you what the blues is. When you ain't got no money, you got the blues. When you ain't got no money to pay your house rent, you still got the blues. A lot of people holler about, I don't like no blue, but when you ain't got no money and can't pay your house rent and can't buy you no food, you damn sure got the blue. Well, you see, you, you had a chance with your life, but you ain't done nothing with it. See, and you got to have the blue. And we ain't talking about the women. We're talking about the life of human beings, how they live. See, now you don't love but one thing, and that's some whiskey. See, and that's plum out of it. That's why it's that. I can tell you. That's why it's that. If you ain't got no money, you got the blues. Because you're thinking evil. That's right. Anytime you're thinking evil, you're thinking about the blues. The sound started mixing in with another form of popular music of the South, simply known as country music. All day I faced a barren waste. Originally, being a tame and often simplistic folky style, it started breaching into more rebellious and faster sounds, originating from the likes of singers such as Johnny Cash. Something started happening at this time. Blues and country started influencing each other in mysterious ways, whether it was from the fact the radio would play them both, causing a stir in the listeners' minds, or the two distinct cultures just decided to borrow from each other in their songwriting. I think probably, you know, a lot of people probably don't appreciate a lot of country music. I suppose I don't appreciate some of it, but uh, basically I think country music is, is our greatest music and probably a hundred years from now, the they'll be studying, yeah. the students will be studying folk music and you, jazz. Have you blues. ever thought about what makes country music and soul music alike? Well, it's, uh, it's from down in here, right, that's James? Right. That's, that's right. That's the name of the game. See, that's the thing that I've always admired when, uh, when I see you work, is I know that uh, well, when you, what you transmit through that tube is you, and the same thing applies to James. And that's really the name of the game. Do you like country music, James? Yeah, I like country music, but most of all, I like it when cats like this, this band do this. You know, he, he really take care of business and uh, tells a story. You know, because there's a lot of cats sing soul, man, that don't get across as well as the others, you know. And the sound eventually found itself branching out further and further and quickly turning into what was eventually called as rock and roll, when a white country singer and guitarist, Elvis Presley, performed the song Hound Dog in a highly sexualized spectacle. This sound took attention primarily to the younger crowd, as it was a style that was simply exciting and fast paced. DJs from around the United States started playing this music as much as they could. The style came to fruition on its natural accord, but the secret of it being a truly unique style is massively construed. The reason why it's often considered the new sound was merely because of the use of the electric guitar. For if you were to play any old rock and roll tune on acoustic, it would sound like any other country and or blues song. But there is more to rock and roll than just the sonic developments of the time period. Much like jazz during the 1920s, rock was celebrated as a breakaway from the confines of the increasingly conservative, rigid mindset of the past generation. Freedom is the root of major American music movements, and this is what rock represented at the time. The sonic aesthetics were merely the icing on the cake. Uh, in listening to you, buddy, it seems like y'all could do something in jazz. Have you ever tried anything along that line? <laughs> no, we hadn't. It's strange that you should say that, because uh, we've always made it a point to more or less not like jazz, actually, and it's kind of in... Uh, in conjunction with rock and roll in one way, and then it's kind of against it, in a way. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's so true. I didn't mean to imply that your music you've played so far, I don't know, for some reason you sort of strike me as a jazz man, <laughs> for some reason. Well, uh, it's probably the glasses or something. <laughs> it could be. Brubeck, man. The new sound popularized throughout the 1950s, with the likes of Chuck Berry, James Brown, Bill Haley, and three of the major artists of the developed scene who suddenly died in a horrific plane crash, including Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and the Big Bopper. 
Eventually, Elvis was also drafted to serve in the U.S. military, and Chuck Berry was swamped in court trials, threatened to serve up to five years in prison, which served to devalue his image as his popularity drifted downwards. People who describe the 1950s and 60s often talk about how rock was the greatest at this time, or how everyone was united under this rock sound, but this is far from the case. Most of the top hits of the 1950s were actually classic crooner ballads. And another genre that is often very much underappreciated. If you go back again to the 1940s, R&B was not only delving into fast-paced electric guitar music, but was actually incredibly diverse sonically, and was key to inspire artists like the Ink Spots, who were key figures in what was eventually coined doo-wop a genre which later paved the way to essentially be the foundation of all contemporary pop music. You know, so we, the uh, back then, rock and roll didn't exist. It was just starting to perk in the streets, you know, starting to, on the dawn of creation, so to speak. I, did a, I put a group called the Belmonts together, and we created this kind of uh, vocal percussion style, because... We couldn't think of any words, honestly. So we, uh, I got these four guys from my neighborhood. I said, Carlo, you got to sing bass. And the way they do that is you sing, Wella, Wella, I don't. And I said, Excuse no. me? Wella, Wella, Wella. Wella. So you got to do this. You got to lean into the mic and yeah. say, Wella, Wella. And Wella, Wella. And he said, I am not going to sing Wella, Wella. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So we started with this thing that was called I Wonder Why. No, why I love you like I do. No, why I do. Don't know why I love you. Don't know why. Not bad. Not bad, Kevin. But can you do Wella Wella? That's the key to, to success. During the time of the 1950s, genres like cool jazz, hard bop, doo wop, croon, and several others dominated the market. All of which could have easily evolved into new territories but were instead marketed to specific crowds. Cool jazz and hard bop, for example, were both styles of music created by members of all races. In fact, both were coined by the exact same person, Miles Davis but were however segregated marketing-wise to adhere to white audiences and black audiences respectively. Doo-wop and rock and roll were among the same phenomenon. During the early 1960s, the wave of rock and roll had ended. Jazz had become disenfranchised, become increasingly more complex and experimental as a means to essentially escape the massive onslaught of industry wave marketing tactics, with its free jazz movement along with Miles Davis and John Coltrane. Blues continued on to exist in small bursts of popularity, but was still largely separated from the mainstream world to slowly be pushed down into obscurity. But a new voice suddenly broke the world by storm, and it was from a simple folk singer out of New York City who could barely sing, barely play guitar, but spoke words which resonated with an entire generation. This lone folk musician was known as Bob Dylan. Folk had been a genre which was nothing new to the world, but the ideas spoken were true and real. Soon the most eye-catching musician of the time was not someone of a new sound, but a sound which had already existed for centuries before. Music had finally been brought back to earth, and the real intent was there. Artists such as Leonard Cohen, Joni Mitchell, and Janis Joplin followed suit in this movement and style as well. However, it was shortly lived as the folk revival eventually came about and a new wave was already created by copycats, trying to ride the wave Dylan had started. Thus, Dylan switched to Electric, which caused a major outlash from his fan base that he sold out, but it was simply due to the fact that his style of folk had already turned conventional. Mr. Dylan, you call yourself a completely disconnected person. Uh, would you like to no, I didn't call myself that. It's, it's, uh... I should have drove those words in my mouth. I saw that in the paper. Uh -huh. How would you describe yourself? What is it that you, you uh, have you analyzed this? Why you appeal to people? I certainly haven't. No. Mr. Dillon, I know you uh, dislike labels and probably rightly so, but uh, for those, those of us who are well over 30, 
could you uh, label yourself and perhaps uh, tell us what your role is? Well, I sort of label myself as well under 30. <laughs> um, and my role is to, uh, you know, to just uh, stay here as long as I can. <laughs> but the power of the music industry was still working. Rock had started to evolve once more with innovations like surfer rock, which is more cutting edge and would later be inspirations to garage rock and punk. But things would come to change when the industry started not to find artists from their own country, but to go searching abroad. It showed its true power with the unveiling of a new rock band inspired by Buddy Holly. The market realized the power of globalized music when a seemingly unconventional home producer by the name of Joe Meek created the hit Telstar in 1962. An instrumental pop song with an early craft synthesizer, and it reached the top of the US billboards. But the group that would eventually change everything as to how the industry was handled were known as the Beatles. A group that while on the surface was just another pop group eventually paved the path for music that continues to be influential to this day. At this point in the mid to late 1960s, rock music had evolved from its roots and was now becoming increasingly psychedelic with innovators such as Jimi Hendrix and Jim Morrison. It became protest music for the increasingly destructive Vietnam War. The styles shifted constantly and the world seemed to have become united by this new ever-evolving sound with massive concerts such as Woodstock. Rock music at this point in time stopped being a simple stylistic convention, but represented a sense of freedom of expression. I'd like to do a song or a piece of music that's just a pure expression of uh, joy. Pure, like a, a celebration of uh, existence, you know. The coming of spring, or the or the sun rising, or something like that. Just pure, unbounded joy. You know, I don't think we've really done that. The psychedelic rock wave managed to break off into the international market. After the Vietnam War, Southeast Asia underwent a psychedelic rock movement, most notable in a small country known as Cambodia. Singers like Sin Sizamuth and Ross Sarasathia took the sound into popularity in this country. However, the movement was short-lived. During the late 1970s, the extremist communist party known as the Khmer Rouge, led by Pol Pot, decimated the cities and cultural foundation of Cambodia, leading to the death of all of their famous musicians. Ross Sarasothea was known to have been forcibly taken to sing a song in front of the Khmer Rouge soldiers, in which she was severely beaten, raped, and murdered after she finished, left alone in the rural plains of Cambodia. Soul music was beginning to take fruition with the evolution of doo wop into the vocal groups like the Supremes and the Miracles. Jazz and rock had eventually fused together through the works of Miles Davis, with Bitches Brew, as well as Herbie Hancock evolving jazz into a more electronic realm. Music was being melded together once more, but like all great moments in history, they will always end. By the 1970s, rock had once more solidified as it was destined to do. Even jazz-rock fusion developed into one of the most hated sounds of both jazz and rock connoisseurs alike, which was known as smooth jazz. 
While specific artists popped up now and again, whether original or not, they were still confined to genres regardless of being a part of them. New forced industry bands started to take form, and rock seemed to have hit its end. Why do you dislike rock and roll so it's much? It's dead, it's a disease, it's a plague, it's been going on for too long, it's history, it's vile. It's not achieving anything, it's just digression. They play rock and roll at airports. That's about as like advanced as it can possibly get. But there it's was a too limited. But there was a time when you didn't feel it that way. It is too much like a structure, a church. Yeah, but there was a religion, a, a farce. A time when you did not feel that way. What made you no, change? No, I've always felt this way. Even when you were with the Sex Pistols? I wondered when you'd get round to that one. Yes, even then. Because the Sex Pistols was going to be the absolute end of rock and roll, which I thought it was. Unfortunately, the majority of the public, being the senile animals that they are, got that wrong. Too bad. All they want is an image. But the style shifted in many ways as well as in the underground. During the 1960s, doo-wop broke into the Caribbean islands, notably Jamaica, and gave birth to the ska movement. A young singer with a backup group rose to prominence during this time with his first hit, Simmer Down, a somewhat protest song against the aggressive culture that existed within gang life of the cities of Jamaica. This singer was known as Bob Marley, and led to the creation and development of reggae music, which shaped music for decades to come. Metal music was birthed with the debut of Black Sabbath, a much darker and sinister look at the rock sound, and openly hopping onto the devil's music trope. As well as punk music with the Sex Pistols, Ramones, and The Clash, all of which took hold of the industry gimmicks to break free of the tired tropes. Throughout all of this time, the guitar reigned supreme and was the centerpiece for all rock music. Funk came on to rise with artists like Sly and the Family Stone, using emphasis on rhythm once more and with grooving bass lines. Funk led on to create disco, and dance music was on the rise once more in underground clubs across New York. The industry was segregated immensely at this point, and it had no real control over the major influx of music styles. They merely had pop music, but even that showed to be fruitless in competition with all the other underground artists. I'll explain briefly why having all these different genres and styles were so hard to market, and that was simply because the fan base was so scattered that they couldn't market any style of music to a large crowd. Everything was almost a niche market, so to speak, with the only popular form of music being disco, which generally was quite an embarrassment in terms of a mainstream culture. Things eventually changed drastically during the 1980s as the innovation of the synthesizer and drum machine became much more prevalent and the industry took hold of all these new genres, mixed them and simplified them to their core. They pumped them out in a new term they coined as the new wave. It mostly stemmed from Europe, with electro bands like Kraftwerk and later on Talk Talk and Genesis. This was the beginning of the massive overtake of not only musical genres, but music culture as well. By combining all elements of the new sonic aesthetics and conventionalizing them into a digestible, marketable sound, New Wave became the easy go-to genre for all pop music in the early 1980s. Some artists of the underground were not very pleased, for the sounds they had created to be unique for their experiences were now commodified as a mere conventional tactic. Even their own subgenres had devolved into disposable music. Punk became a stylistic trope, Bob Marley had passed, and left his image to become a symbol of shallow consumerism. The revolts against New Wave, mostly titled No Wave, held by artists from the like of Sonic Youth, an experimental rock band pushed for more experimental artistic sounds, an equivalent to what bebop had attempted during the 1940s to counter swing music. Most of it was pointless. And honestly, several talented groups arrived from New Wave, including Blondie and the Talking Heads. Uh, what do you think of people who assess your record, and you believe in it, and others perhaps don't, and they don't put it on playlists? You must think about that. When people don't acknowledge it as yes. being val valid? Yes. Um, I think about that, but I, I think that they'll come around to it sooner or later. Anything good gets listened to eventually. 
It should be noted as well, at this time, the way in which people purchased music had changed drastically. Before the 1980s, you would walk into a record store and be able to only purchase whatever the newest music was available. But then as CDs and tapes came into play, there was an incoming demand to redistribute older releases from the golden times. Soon music from the past was now available to all, and this in turn unintentionally helped to view the new sound of the underground. While New Wave was in many ways the amalgamation of all popular music styles, there was a new underground youth movement which attempted the very same thing, but this one had a message to say. Funk had been evolving in the inner city of New York for quite some time. While it experimented with electronic elements, it primarily was based off the sound of the guitar and of the typical band formation. But once the drum machine made its way into the music scene, the sound drastically changed. Quickly, the concept of disco made its way into funk, which was brought to force by playing loops of older records with a standard four-on-the-floor beat. Then by incorporating the reggae-influenced rhythm-oriented vocals and R&B-influenced drum patterns, the genre of hip-hop was born. By choosing to sample older music with electronic beats and synthesizers, Utilizing a vocal style that relied solely off rhythm and cadence, it completely changed the way music was created and distributed. But it wasn't just about the musical conventions that made hip-hop as important as it was. For if it simply was just kept as it was musically, the genre would not have evolved as it would have today. A young group of this new style came to fruition in the late 1970s under Grandmaster Flash. They primarily made this electronic funk style, but the lyrics were often underwhelming. This new sound needed a poet, and from within that group, Duke Booty, wrote a song which completely changed the path of direction for hip-hop. The song titled, The Message, was an incredibly detailed and raw look at life in the contemporary ghetto of New York. Broken glass everywhere, people pissing on the stage, you know they just don't care. I can't take the smell, can't take the noise, got no money to move out, I guess I got no choice. This specific song was the predecessor which took the genre to a place music had never ventured in much before. Like what? What do you mean? What was the scene there? Describe what it what you know, would happen. No, real like a, a rough, you know, people used to get robbed in the party sometimes. Oh, okay. shoot this. What it was is like, okay, you can separate the two yeah, audiences. Anything is liable to happen. You can separate two audiences, like disco audience, mm -hmm. where it's 21 and over, you gotta wear a suit jacket and this, and you gotta dress a certain way. And then there was the other, the other audience. And really, they had nowhere to go. Not saying that we planned it that way, but this is where they came mm -hmm. to us. And those were the guys that, you know, they weren't totally dress conscious. And, um, weren't totally conscious conscious. And no, they, they were carried just, certain no, items they, that they maybe wouldn't be carried in a discotheque. You know, stuff like that. Because, like, how, how we more or less did when we, when we gave parties, we more or less, mostly we got, like, the, the as far as people would, you know, uh, class other people, we got, like, more or less what would be called the lowest standard of the people. We got, you know, all the people that did the hanging out, you know, and the hustling and all that. We always appealed to, you know, those type of people. Hip-hop soon evolved. It became darker, more heavy-hitting. It was in many ways its own unique sound, but quite literally incorporated most, if not all, styles of music of the past. Wu-Tang Clan, a well-known hip-hop collective for incorporating Chinese cultural elements and mixing it with their own, took the world by surprise as to how much you can create with this hip-hop style. House music and techno was of the same development, relying off old disco and funk tunes with faster tempos and added four on the floor drum patterns. Detroit techno came to fruition by adding original synth music and spread to the UK and various parts in Europe. New subgenres for electronic music started to get created. Jungle in the UK, Gabber in the Netherlands. Rave culture became the new hot underground trend for teens in Europe and hip hop in America. Het is gewoon zo, als wij een, een duistere plaats zitten te maken, dan, dan zitten we, als ik dan bijvoorbeeld met, met, de, met die ene jongen die die, die, die prettig heeft, als ik zoiets duisters maak, dan, dan zien wij gewoon die party voor ons en dan, eh, je, je beeld het visueel in je hoofd in, hoe het zou klinken op zo'n party, dat, dat, je, dat je die geluiden helemaal hoort zweven en dat, en, Ik weet het niet, je moet het voelen. 
Het is, het is, het is een, bepaal, een bepaalde sfeer die je creëert met, met, met geluiden plus visuele beelden die je in je hoofd hebt op het moment dat je het aan het maken bent. Maar het is moeilijk uit te leggen wat nou duister is. Want wat duister is voor mij is het misschien wel helemaal niet duister. Ja. <laughs> Rock even had a resurgence once more, and grunge music had taken the older styles of the genre and added a new distorted sound that was much harsher and droned out. Shoegaze of Ireland started to become a new trend as well from the group My Bloody Valentine. New genres sprung up practically every day across the world, and so did the marketability of those subsequent styles. The first to go was hip-hop naturally, as it was generally easy to make with a strong culture and image that related to the youth. Primarily white suburban America was now exposed to the harsh realities of the ghetto, and the culture that came with it was appropriated by the masses. The major innovators of hip-hop eventually passed, those being Biggie Smalls and Tupac Shakur. The wave had taken over hip-hop, and even the genre that was designed to simply be recontextualization became exactly what it tried to oppose. The culture was aestheticized, the musicians that were being brought into the spotlight were not those who wished to evoke a sense of truth, but those who simply followed within the tropes of whatever hip-hop culture was in a marketable fashion. What began as merely an attempt to expose reality became a pathway for other musicians to follow in order to attain a success. For without a specific aesthetic, there was no way to market the hip-hop sound. Regardless of this, hip-hop still continued to evolve into newer territories, with artists such as Kanye West and later on Tyler the Creator. R&B had also been making a comeback during the 90s, with primarily female vocalists such as TLC. Even rock and hip-hop merged together in a short-lived time span with groups like the Beastie Boys. Eminem came into the spotlight and challenged the notion of the rap stereotype by being one of the first mainstream white hip-hop superstars. But all this solidified. Nas eventually boldly proclaimed hip-hop to be dead in 2006 with his album of the same title. If hip-hop is dead and is in a vulnerable state, what role did you play in it? I mean, I'm just as guilty as anybody else for, for, the, you know, for the murder of the rap game, you know what I'm saying? But it's, it's a bunch of things. It's a, the corporate side of the business that killed it, you know what I'm saying? It's mm -hmm. also, uh, we got too much hustle in us because there's so much bread in the rap game that we kind of get lost in it. So I think we all play a part in it. And every time, you know, every, every kind of music gets stagnant every once in a while and then it comes to a point where it needs to be re-energized. Mm -hmm. That just happens with the game often. And uh, it, all kinds of rap, is like out right now that I'm digging, but at the same time, you know, it kind of has its ups and down moments. I think Ice Cube said that one time. It has mm -hmm. like so many ups and downs in it. So at this point of it, I've seen so many of the purists who really love it turn to struggling artists because they're not benefiting, whereas dudes that ain't got no talent is benefiting, you know what I'm saying? So it's just definitely a period where it's been dead. I'm just bold enough to say it. Mm -hmm. Techno of Detroit became EDM. Jungle became drum and bass. House music eventually just merged in and became standard pop music. Even artists who decided to create experimental sounds within the electronic scope tried to come to surface, were labeled by the journalists as intelligent dance music, a term which ultimately led into the short-lived wave cycle that should have never been, simply because the name sounded incredibly pretentious. Grunge eventually died off with the death of Kurt Cobain to also become commodified with other bands who mimicked the constructed sound. Metal music tried to break free of it but ultimately became that exact same convention, only to have more bands try to do a unique twist on a certain sound, only to be lumped in along with copycats into a journalist-created subgenre. The metal sound has continued to evolve and diverge into multiple different subgenres. New metal of the early 2000s featuring artists like Limp Bizkit made major mainstream outputs and were related to one of the more popular cultural movements of the early 2000s, known as emo. Emo started with the development of pop punk with bands like Blink-182 and Good Charlotte, 
which soon took hold of the suburban teenaged angst aesthetic from the 1990s into a mass market production, which served to influence American culture for the coming decades. I think we're good people, and I, and I think our band, and we all, we all have our, our issues, I'm sure, but I mean, but normally I think we pretty much have a good influence on kids. You know, kids are smart, and they know that it's all done as a joke, and they know that it's all in good fun. And actually we make fun of ourselves more than we make fun of everybody else, so. We say bad words and we have bad jokes, but we, you know, it's all part of being a kid and, and letting kids know through our songs that they're not the only ones going through what they go through. And now we have come to the 2010s. Globalized dance music has become the norm in this day and age, a process which originated from the likes of Psytrance in the early 2000s. Later on, a popular style which delved from reggaeton and dub, known as dubstep, came into prominence. What started as another simple genre evolution became another standardized pit of strictly limited conventional genre tropes that was pushed into the spotlight by major music promoters. But along the line of pop and EDM, where did hip-hop venture? Well, it quite literally entered a trap. Hip-hop is still at large, but has now for the most part evolved into a style primarily known as trap music, a term coined by Atlanta rapper Gucci Mane. The conventions of the subgenre are simple, a down-tempo beat with specifically 808 kick drums, rattling hi-hats, and simplistic generally four on the floor on minor key melodies. The beat has existed within hip-hop for quite some time within the South, as hip-hop tended to be slower in that region with artists such as Master P and 3-6 Mafia. But as hip-hop evolved, it also solidified. Much like swing music to jazz, trap has ushered in a whole new era of hip-hop which has polarized many fans of the genre. The beat became increasingly popular until it practically overtook all of production within hip-hop as being another new sound. It melded in with EDM in 2012, as well as branching into various internet micro-genres such as Vaporwave and Witch House. The style of rapping shifted drastically as well. Atlanta-based rapper known as Future set the tone for what would soon be called mumble rap. The style has been criticized immensely, as there has been a debate as to whether the artistic merit of hip-hop has long since been deceased. However, there are some who have described this new style of rap to be a reflection of drug-induced hysteria of the contemporary era, as in many ways these rappers have lost the ability and reason to say meaningful words, to mumble because ultimately words are meaningless when representing emotion. I had your conversation, bro. Then tell me what you want from hip hop. I mean, you don't think that's a question you should answer at some point? What do I want from hip hop? Or are you leaving all of this to QC to figure out? Nah, I mean, I'm just ma I'm making music, bro. I'm just having fun. You know what I'm saying? You My fans you're gonna love have it. You're going to have a problem with just having fun in five years. What did you what want from hip hop? You're you going to have a big problem so with what just having yeah, fun. You, you don't sound you like you very aware but what with what's it? going on, and you one of the hottest niggas on earth. But what do you want me to say? You want me to say, I want you to be aware of your business. I want you to know whether you're in a 360 or not. I want you to appreciate the culture that changed your life oh. and took you from college dorm rooms eating fucking oodles and noodles. I want you, who's well-spoken and articulates himself well. My nigga, chill. Yeah, hold on. In many ways, the style of mumble rap coincides with another stylistic trope, of which two coincided with swing music of the 1930s, which was known as scat. A technique started from Louis Armstrong and Ella Fitzgerald, which involved vocalizing rhythm without words. Eventually, even becoming a cliche used to mimic what early jazz sounded like. The personas of the rapper shifted as well to become more and more extravagant. The power of the internet showed its true force when a seemingly unknown rapper by the name of Soldier Boy went viral in 2007 with his one hit wonder, Crank That Soldier Boy. Internet personalities such as Lil B the Bass God innovated the concept of the online persona by delving into multiple different concepts in his releases, as well as having a distinct Twitter style with simplistic but profound phrases he would often quote himself on. But in this age of constant streaming of online music, 
journalists and copycat musicians continue to be pushed to the front of the headlines. Even still, there have been breakouts from original beat makers such as Jay Dilla and later on Kay Trinata to try and develop the hip hop sound, but their unique style as well has been quickly conventionalized through the copycat phenomenon known as SoundCloud music. Even something on the opposite spectrum, indie pop, followed this trend as well. While it started out as a mere attempt to individualize the idea of pop music into more artistic territory, with arts like MGMT, Mac DeMarco, and Lord, it eventually conventionalized into another mass-produced style. It is the current scope of many musicians that are made up of people trying to sound like other people, and this is ultimately at the fault and radical exponential growth of the wave phenomenon. And I will say this, the real music that has existed throughout the ages was not confined by sonic tropes. People didn't listen to the music only because it sounded a certain way, or because it had a strong political connotation. They listened to it simply because it sounded good. As we have continued to evolve musically, the scope in which how many genres we can possibly create is becoming more and more limited, and yet every day a journalist seems to discover their new fangled hot new genre of the month. The new form of music categorization has had incredible power over the flow of music history in recent times, and the industry knows this. For one of the few ways to get noticed in this world is by having a good PR campaign, or by simply being lucky with a certain hit song that blows up on the internet for a few months. And what comes down to in the end is merely about who has the most money, or who is the most meme-worthy. The waves for music have gotten increasingly faster and faster. The reality that a genre can exist solely on the internet, without any culture or regional location tying to it whatsoever, is purely a phenomenon that has existed only within the past decade. But to also simply ignore the fact that the music industry has been partaking in the direction of wave for nearly 100 years is complete ignorance. It is unfortunate, much like throughout history, that if a critic cannot describe a sound without relating it to some other form of conventionalized formatting, it is not considered to be a legitimate work of music to be categorized in the grand algorithm of online streaming services. The new industry takeover isn't from one genre anymore, but by the amalgamation and categorization of them all. Much like the issues relating to European music between the Renaissance and the Industrial Revolution, artists are no longer liberated in terms of being able to express themselves in a way that can be marketed properly. Spotify playlists with names like Chill Vibes or Piano with Reverb are the new forms of categorization. In this era, it is becoming increasingly difficult to find a varietal collective of music because it is not marketable to do so. Musicians are essentially coerced both socially and monetarily to enter genres instead of doing something unique. Ask yourself this, when you go on YouTube and let's say for instance listen to lo-fi beats for homework or 24 hours in Japan chill wave trap beats, are you really paying attention to the individual artists to find new interesting music or are you just looking for a specific sonic aesthetic to repeat over and over again as one unified central thing because it is more convenient to do so? The question as to whether it is the music industry controlling the flow of music or if it's the masses doing it to themselves is often debated. I like to think of it as both. It is so much easier to find a playlist of music that all sounds the same than it is to go dumpster diving into the depths of music hell to find something that you like. The music industry is simply there to help supply a demand. People don't want to have to find music for themselves and would rather it be brought to them. There are so many factors in this phenomenon as to why things happen but the bottom line comes down to what is being promoted and for what reasons. Music for so long has been rooted in the geographical location of its creation. A scene is cultivated in a specific area and grows and solidifies in that one spot until it can be available for the world. But now we have entered into a new age and the internet has drastically changed things. Our route of inspiration is no longer geographical, but simply by whatever we choose to listen to. All of the world's music is one click away, and the question we ask someone, what kind of music do you listen to, is most often answered as, I listen to pretty much everything. So for anyone afraid of where art is heading on a consumerist level, remember where the real market's desires reside in. The new sound is no new sound, 
the new waves that increasingly become faster and faster are soon reaching a point of singularity. The future of music does not rely off the musical conventions, and people will only listen to music that is good. For only the true timeless artists will never be confined to one specific genre. For they are the artists that don't make music from a specific city, but they make it from this earth, from their heart, and from the spirit of God. Waves were made to crash and die, but in the end, it is the vaporous soul of the unique that drifts on forever.